Palisade Radio is preparing to release an in-depth report on the fundamentals of uranium, including our top three picks for 2019. Sign up today at palisaderadio.com to be the first to receive our exclusive report. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell, and we are back for our ninth part of our 10-part uranium series, where we've been talking to the biggest names in the business, fund managers, money managers, CEOs, and investors in the space. Today, we have two gentlemen on the line, Rob Crayford and Keith Watson. They co-manage the Geiger Counter Fund, which is based out of London. Rob, Keith, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you, Colin. Well, let's do this. I usually don't have uh, two people on the line that I'm going to interview, so uh, we'll try to keep this organized. Let's start with Rob. Uh, just a bit of a background uh, on yourself and how you got into the uranium space. Uh, yeah, well, um, I'm a geologist by education, um, but ultimately, rather than sort of living in too remote a jurisdiction, I opted to, to live in London and go into the world of finance. So um, I've been focusing on the resource sector since 2004. Um, and then I've been working directly with uh, New City and the Geiger Counter Fund since, uh, well, about eight and a half years. Excellent. And then, Keith, how, how about yourself? I started in the resources industry as a buy-side uh, portfolio manager in 92, uh, looking at the energy space. Um, my background is in applied physics, which has some leanings towards this sector, but I'd say only slightly. Um, as you might uh, perhaps be counter to expectation. But yes, I've looked at the uranium space in a lot more detail since the um, early mid 2000s and then came over to join CQS in 2013, um, jointly managing the Geiger Fund, um, as you discussed. Excellent. Well, let's start off with a bit of a discussion about the uranium space overall. Many of our listeners are familiar with the case for nuclear power. Nuclear power makes up a significant amount of baseload uh, energy worldwide, specifically uh, in the United States and several countries in Europe. That has been the case for the last couple decades, and in that time, uranium prices have gone up and down. They're now down um, considerably, but starting to show some signs of life. So what do you see as the bull, ca bull case for uranium um, in more of an imminent sense, so something that can move the market in the next couple of years? Well, I mean, if I start, um, I think ultimately we just have a much tighter market today than we did even 12 months ago. And looking forward, it looks like it's going to increasingly tighten. Now, in discussing this, being, being number nine in your series, there's a high risk of us duplicating a number of the things that have already been discussed. But if, I mean, if we just talk on the build out first, because there's very little risk to the build out scenario because these reactors are being built. We can see that that, that demand is coming. So we currently have 447 reactors globally. There's 58 reactors in construction with a further 157 planned. But if we take those new reactors and note the fact that they're actually larger than the existing reactors, we can see that we've got a significant growth in demand. And that's driven primarily by China and their focus is on clean air. And we see many measures coming through where they're trying to reduce pollution within major cities. Um, and that, so that's actually being driven by more social issues than just economic. Yet at the same time, if we look at Chinese nuclear reactors, they're actually comparable to coal within China on a levelized cost of energy basis. So it's still the second cheapest source of electricity supply uh, in, in China. Yet at the same time, the most environmentally friendly because it has zero carbon emissions. India equally has a, a similar type story, but not to the same scale. We also have a number of restarts. So we have uh, we, have Japan, we have Japan back up to nine reactors now. There's a further six approved and 13 under review. Belgium just recently announced that they're restarting too. And we also believe that a number of other Western economies, including Germany and France, are going to struggle to um, reduce down their reactor fleet over time, given their commitments to the Paris Climate Accord and also the fact that we've seen an increase in power costs domestically, which is impacting their domestic manufacturing. So that is the demand side, which I think is relatively clear. 
the real tightness has come from the recent change in the supply side. And I'm sure this has been addressed multiple times through these conversations, but I'd be happy to discuss in, in more detail. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about Japan. I posed the question to Rick Rule just a couple days ago on the program that this is a very opaque market. You've stated that nine reactors are back online. That leaves quite a few left to come. Um, but it's very hard to find out information about Japan's intentions and timelines on when more reactors are going to go online. How much of an impact does the Japanese story continue to have on the uranium market? Um. I'll answer this section or at least um, talk to it. I think you're right in highlighting that there are some difficulties in knowing the timeline of exact reactor restarts, but I think it's probably easier to put it in perspective of the more recent news, certainly from the Hiroshima High Court, which okayed the restart of the Ikata reactor to bring the nine that we have currently online. Um, and I would still put that in the context of the pro Abe or pro nuclear Abe government's energy policy plan, which has nuclear um, at something like a 20 to 22% share of the overall power supply market um, in the next decade or so. And that will require another 20 reactors coming on stream. Um, over, I think, the medium term um, in order to justify that. And we have a number of reactors which are um, already in the wings um, with approvals underway, but that still has to go through the local court proceedings in Japan, which creates some of that uncertainty. But the overall energy policy in that country, I think, is quite clear. And the recent news flow, I think, adds to that um, comfort that we have that that particular region is coming back on. I mean, I would just add, I think the whole Japan restart story is actually just the icing on the cake for what's a, a relatively, well, what is an increasingly tightening, tightening market. Even without that, it's very easy to put a very bullish case towards uranium overall. Excellent. Well, I was taking a train ride through Italy the other day, and I happened to pass right by what looked like a nuclear power plant. And sure enough, when I looked it up, it was a nuclear power plant that was built in the 80s, uh, along with a few others in Italy, and none of them ever started despite billions of dollars of investment. And I bring that point up to underline the political motivations that can sometimes overtake economic sensibility. And, and especially we saw this after the Japan tsunami with um, Germany, and you also mentioned Belgium shutting down. Are there any, um, I, I guess, countries that have significant nuclear power that are currently operating where you guys see a risk to the overall demand picture based on any type of pressures? Um, in terms of risk to demand reduction, at the moment, I'd say the um, swell of opinion in one of the countries in Europe, which is perhaps most at risk, is Germany. And um, they'd already announced the closure of their reactor fleet by 2022. And I think we're starting to see a bit of pushback against the energy vend policies uh, that have been put forward by the coalition government there. As Rob, my colleague, highlighted, we have had something like a 20 to 25 percent increase in average electricity prices um, in Germany over the last few years. If you looked at the spot price at the moment, it's actually up over 50% on the average of last year. Um, and we're looking at something like six euro cents a kilowatt hour um, out there. But that is creating problems for the um, small um, Mittelstadt um, companies, as we've seen in some of the recent news. And that is reducing Germany's competitiveness. Combined with that, I'd say we're having the... Um, consequence um, against the green policy that in many cases we're seeing RWE um, demothball some of its old gas-fired power and also looking to expand some of its lignite coal um, mining facilities in order to switch back on some of its uh, coal generating capacity, particularly over the winter, to reduce the risk of potential brownouts that they'd experienced a couple of years ago. 
And I think that might be indicative of pressures that will feed back up through the chain and perhaps we'll see some kind of adaptation to that energy vend um, policy that um, is currently in place for the better in terms of energy demand. I think there are some smaller economies where unfortunately the age of the reactor fleets probably um, will make that more difficult. But I think it's very instructive in particular in Germany, one of the larger European nations which has um, started to hit this um, competitive issue as a result of higher electricity prices that have come into force. France, we've already heard, have rode back slightly in terms of the rate at which they are looking to de-emphasize their nuclear power generating capacity. And I think in the US, which is the largest market, um, we've had some helpful uh, state policy come through with zero carbon emissions being one of those factors added into um, energy uh, prices received by um, those reactors which sell into the open market and which don't have forward contract prices already agreed. And um, I think that is um, something that is very sensible. I think ultimately that is very true of Japan. It is, after all, um, I think uh, very um, intuitive that they should switch back on their existing fleet, which has had um, third generation um, adaptations uh, performed on it where it's found to be sound. And with any luck, we'll see some um, good news flow and continued improvement in the momentum at the local court level, which will allow that to continue. But in the meantime, I don't think we can step away from the fact that really we just want to see a stable developed market demand profile. Yes, with Japan coming back on stream, but really the growth driver behind this is very much the environmental aspects put forward by China. And I think similarly, India is increasingly seemingly coming onto that, um, that bandwagon as well. And just, I mean, interestingly, to add to on that, we just saw with Germany that they've actually started having environmental groups starting to protest in support of nuclear as they realise that, that coal is the only other option for baseload. So th there is a bit of a groundswell of increasing support for nuclear overall. And we, you know, we know Patrick Moore, who, who was the founder of Greenpeace, has actually now come out as, an, uh, as a supporter of, of nuclear power. So there's definitely a, a groundswell amongst environmental groups to realise that it's, it is the best of the options as we shift to a more electrified global world. As this discussion would suggest, and I think the facts are lining up, um, there's a, a very bullish case for uranium, and that's maybe already been reflected in the spot price moving up 50% over the last 18 months. What At what point uh, will there be enough critical mass? And I know that nobody can really pinpoint that exactly, but maybe ideas. When, when does that critical mass hit where the uranium price actually moves to uh, a critical point, the point of incentive price for production, which people have said is $40 or $60, but certainly something much higher than where it's at right now. Well, I mean, we, we've had many discussions with multiple producers, but I mean, I guess on the key ones, I, th I think the first projects to look at would be those brownfield restarts. And within that would include the likes of MacArthur River. Um, you'd also have sort of Paladin's project with Langer Heinrich. And there's, and there's different levels of incentive pricing to bring those back on. Beyond that, I think you would need probably a higher level. But I mean, if we start with, with MacArthur River, I think Calico being reasonably sort of vocal with guiding towards something in the mid 40s with a preference for higher. I mean, they're generally looking to strike to sign those term contracts. But as we know, they still have Cigar Lake running. And if we look look out the next couple of years, they're not fully covered by contract. So those earlier stage contracts they're going to sign are all going to be focused to Cigar Lake production. So actually, it's only going to be the term contracts that are signed beyond those Cigar Lake term contracts that even start to feed into justifying any restart of that of MacArthur River. So with MacArthur River being, you know, circa 8% of production and that having been temporarily closed, that's obviously one of the big reasons for the for the near term shortfall. But that just being taken out for the next few years, even if it was to come back on, actually the growth in demand we see um, suggests that it's not only going to be required, it's still not even going to meet the deficit. But I think to come back to your question, 
um, I think, minimum of mid-40s. We know Cameco and other parties are certainly looking for price escalators within that as well. So they would look for a floor price and they would want to have some participation on the upside into a stronger uranium price. So it's not as simple as a straight dollar number. Um, but yes, that would be where it starts to come in. But for any new projects to be built, realistically, um, most of the ones we look at would need to be 50 plus with the exception of um, of, of next gen, really, as I look through the projects as they stack up today. For greenfield project development? Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the factors which has delayed much of this is the fact that we had Kazakhstan ramping up production at a time which shortly after was followed by um, the Fukushima incident, which switched off Japan. Now I think we've got both of those working the other way and that Kazakhstan is becoming more commercially minded and reducing supply at the same time that Japan is coming back on stream. The underlying trends around the rest of the world have been um, relatively far less material than those two factors which are now moving in favour. And then we have the lag in the system which is reflected or a result of the long-term nature of many offtake and utility supply contracts which are also in full flow runoff at the minute. So we're at that price discovery point, which once we get some of the um, potential excess inventory worked through, then very seriously and very quickly, we step through the, the price points on the cost curve. And you know that's where we are. That's what Rob, I think, um, precisely put his uh, mark down on. You know, we're looking at sort of uh, some of the better projects in the 40s making good good margins as we see it but thereafter you very quickly move up to higher pricing and as we know there's um there's no elasticity in demand to pricing given it's such a low component of the overall power generation cost so if uranium was to double triple quadruple it would make non no to little impact on demand excellent well let's segue into Kazakhstan you just brought that up and one thing we haven't discussed yet on this series even though we're up to part nine is the Kazataprom IPO which has recently been announced I believe the company is talking about selling roughly 25 percent of the shares to the public market a couple different angles that that brings up which could be interesting is firstly what kind of interest does that ignite in the equity market for uranium, which most people don't really know exists, and also how could that change how Kazataprom is run? Um, obviously, they were producing uranium and selling it at spot price, which didn't necessarily make sense from a business standpoint. It made sense more from a communist mentality. Um, so how is that going to change the operations of the biggest producer? Well, I mean, I don't think we're going to be the first to say it, but it's, it's definitely going to drive a value over volume type approach to the business. Um, I think overall it's going to be positive for the sector in that it's going to draw greater attention to it, it's going to bring new investors into the story, um, the whole sort of uranium thesis. So I think that in itself is also supportive. But I mean, the, the main one is ultimately that value over volume. So they're being more disciplined. And part of that, we believe, was coming into this IPO. They needed to demonstrate that they had control of those JVs ahead of first production. Oh, sorry, ahead of um, <clears throat> sorry, ahead of the IPO, because that's obviously key. So, yes, they're going to look to well, as we are hearing it, look to issue twenty five percent of the listed shares. So that would leave you as a minority owner. They've also been reducing down their excess inventories with the sale to Yellow Cake. So, ultimately, we we, we think it's very much positive for the sector, and we also think we're going to see a greater shift from spot sales to term contracts. So previously they had been selling the majority of their production on the spot market, and that was due to requirements within Kazakhstan. But now they're actually going to be able to strike contracts on a term basis, which should help lift up the front end of the curve. Excellent. I want to ask both of you about the overall markets and how that could cause implications for the uranium equities. I don't think that the, the Dow or the general equity is starting to come down is going to affect the uranium price itself very much. But 
for investors looking to start to deploy, to deploy capital right now into the uranium space, it certainly must be a concern um, if the overall markets start to come down because when equities get sold as a whole, they oftentimes all get sold uh, when liquidity is a problem. What is uh, your opinion on how to kind of protect against that or just to keep in mind when investing in the space? Well, I'm not going to say that the equities are going to be uncorrelated. When we see a liquidity crunch, then everything does show a degree of correlation. What I would flag with this is it's very much a defensive sector, and you can you can invest in it with comfort that it's not correlated to the direct market from an earnings perspective. That doesn't mean that you're not going to see some degree of correlation, but you can certainly feel more comfortable that the earnings stability or future prospects of the industry aren't going to necessarily be impacted because the drivers are very, very different and much longer term. And as we've seen through the length of this downturn, that actually the cycles are much longer than any normal kind of investment cycle. And that kind of feeds into you know, the long time it takes to build out a new reactor, the long time it takes to get a new project permitted, brought online. So it's, it kind of operates in its own cycle and we are currently at a very much discounted price, which in itself is defensive. Um, and as flagged, it should be uncorrelated to the best of its ability. Yeah, I think it's very difficult for um, probably any asset class to escape the liquidity cycles that um, unconventional policy has led to um, globally. But as Rob said, I do think that we've got a very different business cycle in this sector to any other. Yeah, well put indeed. I saw a couple of years ago somebody making the case that the uranium bear market at that point had reached about six years and that from a bear market perspective, uh, it was getting to the point of being unprecedented and then using certain metrics to suggest that when something gets into a bear market for that duration, it's inevitable that it will snap up and a certain strength, but leaving out, of course, the, the fact that uranium does tend to have extremely uh, long cycles compared to other sectors. Um, I, I want to ask the, you guys about MacArthur River because we just had Warren Irwin on the show. He's a large shareholder through his fund of NextGen, and so I think it might have been um, a bit of in his interest to make this argument, but it was an interesting one, and he claimed that MacArthur River uh, was shut down not just for um, the the uh, non-depletion of reserves at low prices, but in fact that MacArthur River would not make sense to reopen um, because the mine was getting to a point of, of not being a good mine anymore for Cameco. Is that something that you guys have heard anything about? That that would not be my impression. My my understanding is more that they were able to buy uranium so cheaply on the spot market and deliver into higher price contracts that they preferred to do that rather than run down their existing inventory. If that were to be the case, that would clearly be even more positive, but in no way would we require that to justify this bullish scenario that we're that we're trying to outline. Um, our belief is that it will be restarted, um, but it isn't going to be restarted any time. A lower soon. price of yeah. something like 45 um, on a contract price level at the bare minimum. I think that's what we would infer from some of the forward yeah. price data that's been provided by the Cameco group. Yeah, they don't. I mean, they don't seem in any rush to particularly restart because ultimately, rushing back to restart it would ultimately harm their overall business. And especially with the what looks like a positive outcome on the CRA, they aren't constrained. They have a bit more balance sheet flexibility to to potentially, you know, d delay the restart. But I, I don't believe there's anything structurally wrong with the mine. I, I would say though that there is some strategic value within next gen for being such a large resource and lying so attractively um, at the low end of the global cost curve. So that's certainly something I would probably um, lean in that direction as opposed to saying that perhaps um, MacArthur River is, is, in, is a tired, um, tired mine. 
certainly makes sense, and I think that that is the consensus view. Rob, Keith, I want to thank you for coming on the program and sharing a wealth of knowledge with investors who are very interested in the uranium space. Before I let the both of you go, uh, just any information you can give to listeners about how to follow the Geiger Counter Fund, how to potentially invest, or how to get in contact with your group. Um, yeah, well, we have a website. So the website um, is www.ncim. .co.uk. Um, we are a UK-based firm. Uh, the fund is called Geiger Counter. That has a ticker on Bloomberg of GCL space LN. Um, but yeah, if people want to get in contact with us, we have an email address via that website that people can contact us through. Perfect. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming on the program. And I'll look to get you back on here soon. Okay. Thank you very much. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?